Okay, everyone. Hello. I'm glad to introduce our speaker today, Chris Potts from Stanford, and he is in the linguistics department and the computer science department and the AI lab and the NLP lab. He is in all those places at Stanford and um, and I believe actually the chair of the linguistics department at the moment. Is that right? Sure, yes. Okay. <laughs> Here to the job. Yeah. <laughs> so um, he's a very busy person and we uh, thank him for accepting our invitation to speak to us, especially since he does not get a nice dinner and the other things that he would get if he actually came here. So thank you so much for having me. I really do regret not being able to travel to Pittsburgh. I have a real soft spot for Pittsburgh. Uh, it'd be fun to be there. The commute is easier uh, doing it this way, but I do um, miss being on site. But anyway, yeah, special thanks to the students who met with me this morning. Those were wonderful, stimulating meetings. It's just great to hear about what people are up to. Uh, and as I was saying, like, uh, the title of my talk is Toward More Meaningful Benchmarks for Natural Language Understanding, but we could really think of this as an excuse to think expansively about how we're measuring progress and ensuring that we develop robust systems in the context of especially natural language understanding problems, but we could go even further afield and think about the impact that AI is having and where we're headed. But I will, as you'll see, focus on one particular kind of effort toward more meaningful benchmarks, which would be data sets that help us measure progress and develop robust systems. So here's my kind of overview and I hope this resonates with you all. As usual, I think a lot of us feel like it's the best of times and the worst of times. Like we have all these amazing breakthroughs. It feels in some sense like we're proceeding at breakneck speed. And on the other hand, maybe a feeling of stasis, a feeling that we're all kind of doing the same things. And that's paired with this feeling that by any measure, we as a field are having more impact and more success. Um, but also that has led us to be more aware of where we're falling short. And that could, you could feel that tension. And when you think about deploying products like in industry as part of services and stuff, it's that same story. We have widespread adoption of our ideas much more than ever before. Um, but that has also made us aware of how much frustration there is with precisely the tools that we're deploying. All right, so the question that I want to have on our minds through this session is how will we get out of this rut? It's obviously just a locally optimal point in some larger landscape. What will we do to change things? Um, and I do just wanna emphasize that I feel, even though it might feel like we're in sort of a holding pattern here, this is absolutely the most exciting time in history to be doing NLU. I've actually been sort of taken aback. So every spring I teach a large course called Natural Language Understanding. I've just begun it. Um, and I've been taken aback over in the last few years that students have more or less said to me that they are worried that they've joined the field at the end, you know, when all the big problems were solved and it was just a matter of following through on other people's ideas. And I hope when they see the surprise look on my face that they realize that's not so. And I try to emphasize for them that this is the most exciting moment precisely because we're having this impact and moving fast but all of the big questions are still out in front of us. I'm getting this a little bit less because I feel like we as NLPers are pretty introspective and got, have gotten the word out that there are problems. Um, and that's made students aware that there's more to be done. But I do just wanna emphasize, yes, this is an exciting moment and big things are ahead of us. So here's my plot. I wanna emphasize that a bit more. I wanna talk about how we are in some sense in a golden age, specifically for natural language understanding because uh, it wasn't always so. However, I need to temper that. Uh, we're going to take a peek behind the curtain and talk about how things are not all as they seem on the surface. And that will be my cue to talk about a new data set that we're released, that we've just released, called Dynascent, which is a dynamic benchmark for sentiment analysis. And I'm going to talk with you about how we constructed the data set and what I think we've learned from that. And then that'll be an invitation again for us to draw some general lessons and think expansively about other things we could do in this space. So let's dive in. It's a golden age for NLU. And for me, I'd say an important moment for that is the moment when Watson, IBM Watson, beat these two human champions on Jeopardy. And so Watson is at its heart, I guess, a large scale open domain question answering system. 
It was an integrated system that was also very good at playing Jeopardy, and that's important. It was fast on the buzzer and everything else, but it was also, for the time, astoundingly good at the task of answering Jeopardy quiz questions. And this felt meaningful for me because, you know, past major successes like this had been for things like chess and checkers, things that feel very structured. And this felt like a first moment where you were seeing something that was kind of human and about communication where humans had been beaten. And a really striking thing, so that was 2011. Just a few years later, this is Jordan Boyd Graber, you know, outstanding researcher in NLP. He could beat that champion, Ken Jennings, with a system that was just running on his laptop called Quanta. So in the matter of just a few years, we went from something that was at least described as a supercomputer, that is IBM Watson, um, to competing with champions in a way that you all could compete with champions for a class project if you wanted to. So really striking moment of progress there. And then of course, that was the moment, like around 2011, that's the launch of Siri. That's when we started to get all of these artificial assistants and see that NLU was the future and it was going to be on everyone's mind. So the more trusting of you at this point might have some of these devices living in your homes with you and listening to you all the time. Um, I will just confess that very often, you know, the most striking thing about them is just how good the speech to text component is. And I think we're all aware that the NLU part often falls short, but still, let's remind ourselves, they help us with meaningful tasks and often do lead to productive human machine partnerships. And this felt like science, this, you know, things that we do today would have felt like science fiction 15 or 20 years ago. Image captioning, right? This is a case controllable text generation for the longest time we as a field did not do well with text generation. And then you've gotten recently this explosion of systems that work, right? So this is from a paper from 2014 that kind of launched the image captioning effort again. Uh, there's some, got some images here. Those are the inputs. These systems assign what looks like fluent, accurate descriptions of these images, right? A person riding a motorcycle on a dirt road, a group of young people playing a game of Frisbee. It's fluent text full sentences, and it looks like they're accurate descriptions. Uh, it's not something that we could have done 20 years ago, really at all. Uh, I think it's completely fine to be a little bit jaded about how these systems actually work at this point. I'll return to that, but let's remind ourselves um, that at least on the surface, this looks quite amazing. And then of course, that has led to this explosion of work on text generation with things like GPT-3. So here's a company, copy.ai, that uses, I believe, GPT-3 to generate advertising copy. This is really playing to the strengths of these models because you might have noticed that they are really good at capturing something about the, the style of certain genres of text. And so here, just with a little bit of information, they can capture various voices that you might want your marketing copy to have. Uh, and this is a similar case. This is from a startup from Yoav Shom. Uh, that helps you adjust the style of text that you write. I think this is like a supercharged, autocomplete thing for your phone that will help you calibrate your style and make interesting word choices. Again, I think playing to the strengths of these models and doing things that are meaningful and helping people with the task of writing copy, or in this case, the task of writing text that they want to write. Very exciting. We should remind ourselves that search is also at this point heavily driven by technologies from natural language understanding. If you go onto Google now and search just the one word thing SARS, it will kind of try to anticipate your intentions and give you back a structured info box that's drawing on lots of integrated knowledge resources, but also farming your query out to services that try to re recognize your intention. So that if you search SARS, you get this summary of the disease. If you search parasite, though, it kind of figures out that you want to know about the movie and it tries to anticipate your intentions around where you might see it and so forth and how it's been evaluated and stuff like that. And this is just a glimpse of what's happening when you do a search on a search engine right now. It's not just doing a look up into an index. It's first trying to figure out whether it's a text message or a request for directions or a search into a structured database and so on and so on. Those are essentially semantic parsing tasks at heart. And then let's turn to the technical parts of this. So for us as a field, I think you might have noticed that our benchmarks, our big tasks that we use to train systems and measure progress, are saturating 
faster than ever, where by saturate, I mean, they're reaching our human, our, our estimate of human performance, right? So here's a plot from a paper I did with a bunch of people recently. I've got a few benchmarks here. Along the x-axis, I have time stretching back into the 90s. And along the y-axis, we have a normalized measure of distance from whatever the estimated human baseline is in black here. So you can see for early benchmarks like MNIST, which is images um, of digits, and switchboard, which would be like a speech to text benchmark, it took a long time to reach human parity, decades, right? Uh, this green line is ImageNet, another famous benchmark. It took about half that amount of time to surpass human performance as estimated. And then for these more recent ones like Squad in red, Squad 2.0 in purple, and Glue in orange, the time has just gotten more and more compressed so that for Glue, a major benchmark for natural language understanding, it took less than a year for systems to surpass human performance. So something is happening here. And if you just showed someone this chart and explained what the lines meant, they would reflect back to you, I think, that this must reflect some kind of enormous step forward in the way we're doing things. Let's dive into that a little bit. This is the squad leaderboard. I actually should have checked again. When I made this screenshot, I had to go all the way to place 13 to find a system at 86.7 that was less good than the estimate of human performance, which they have kindly left at the top of this leaderboard, even though numerically the best systems are now quite far along both these metrics, far above this estimate of human performance. <laughs> um, I was involved with the Stanford Natural Language Inference Corpus, and it's been a similar story. And this, I confess, really did catch me off guard, right? So again, along the x-axis here, I have time. Along the y-axis, I have the F1 score, you know, the measure of how well the system is doing. And in the original paper we wrote, we had a human estimate, which is at about 91. That's in red there. And Sam has curated, Sam Bowman has curated all these systems on a web page. So you could just look at how the community has hill climbed on this problem. From the estimates that we had in our original paper, which now look vaguely embarrassing down there at about 78, very rapidly the community kind of hill climbed. And then in 2019 had, had surpassed our estimate of human performance. Uh, glue, I mentioned glue. The glue paper is charming because it says in 2018, solving glue is beyond the capability of current transfer learning methods. And of course, I would have endorsed that claim as well because glue in 2018 looked incredibly ambitious. Glue is a collection of about 10 different NLU tasks. And the glue challenge is to train a system that can, with only minor adjustments, do well across all of those disparate tasks. So it's not like just one isolated squad victory or isolated SNLI victory. This is meant to be a big deal, testing capabilities in a bunch of maybe opposing directions. So yeah, this should have been a benchmark that stood for decades, but no. Uh, here is the human at 15, 15th place, the glue human baselines down here at 87.1. And we have systems that are at, at almost 91 up here. So, and that happened with just a matter of year. And the, the, uh, the team launched Superglue. Superglue was meant to be an even more challenging benchmark. The tasks are even more diverse and unusual and push in all sorts of interesting directions. That was 2019, and I have to give the month down here as February, because just last month, we saw some teams creep past the humans at, at, point, at place three here. And of course, they're just gonna keep climbing past us. <laughs> and so I guess that was roughly a year again for superglue. So what might you conclude from this? Well, you might, if, if I just showed you all these things and you weren't a practitioner, think that we are seeing very rapidly the fears that are uh, expressed in this book by Nick Bostrom called superintelligence, where we have designed these systems with objectives that we think we understand, but they've already passed us in terms of their performance what's going to happen when they go shooting past us and do all sorts of unanticipated things. It might look, based on what I've just shown you, like we're on the verge of such a scary thing happening. I'm going to burst that bubble a little bit, but before I do that, I'm just at pains to say that 
even though I think the gains aren't the way I've been describing them, they are striking. We should remind ourselves that even as we become jaded and think about all the tricks these systems are pulling, they are entering competitions and doing tasks that 20 years ago we had no systems that could do. So something interesting has happened, but I wanna temper a little bit precisely what has happened. So let's take a peek behind the curtain here. Uh, this is a, a screenshot from the movie Blade Runner where to figure out whether agents are human or machine, they perform very sophisticated Turing tests. And I guess my point is that we don't have to be so sophisticated to reveal what these systems are actually like at this point. I mentioned Watson before. I do want to emphasize, I think Watson was amazing, but it also very quickly reveals itself to be adopting pretty superficial strategies. So here's one comical instance of that. Remember that Jeopardy does this reversal of questions and answers. So the prompt is the answer, grasshoppers eat it. And Watson's confident response was, what is kosher? This is not the sort of response that any human would give. It's only barely even sort of grammatical and it's certainly not discourse coherent, but test your understanding uh, of the tricks these systems might pull. Why did Watson say, what is kosher in response to grasshoppers eat it? The answer, is that Watson was really a machine for mining information from Wikipedia, which is certainly familiar in 2021, 10 years later. And there are a lot of discussions on Wikipedia about whether things like grasshoppers and other unusual creatures um, are kosher to eat. And Watson just saw all of those distributional similarity points and thought that that would be a perfectly reasonable thing to answer for grasshoppers eat it, which is at the very least, getting all of the semantic roles confused. But really, I think that's too generous. And what we're seeing here is that it's just depending on something like proximity in these texts uh, to find most of its answers. This is Siri. Um, I probably should have figured out how to play you this clip because Stephen does a much better job than I do. But the 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 pretense of this skit is that he has been playing with his iPhone all day and therefore has failed to write the show that he is now filming. And so he turns to Siri for help and he says, for the love of God, the cameras are on, give me something that is, you know, give me something like a script. And Siri's response is, what kind of place are you looking for? Cameras or churches? This is another quiz for the practitioners. Why did it say this? Well, again, it's a superficial distributional thing. It saw God and thought churches. It saw cameras and thought camera stores. That is what it's primed to do. Those are entities that in some sense knows about. But of course, all it's doing is kind of keying into keywords and these utterances. This is revealing here that it doesn't really know anything about what Stephen asked. Uh, and the discourse continues and he says, I don't want to search for anything. I want to write the show. And true to form, Siri says, searching the web for search for anything. I want to write the shuffle. Let's forgive it this little text-to-speech error here and just focus on the fact that it did what systems have been doing ever since Eliza, which is in response to um, something it didn't understand, it fell back on a cheap trick. Eliza would just ask you, ask you how you were feeling about whatever you had said, and Siri searches the web for the string that it thinks you spoke. Yeah, so very far from uh, anything like artificial general intelligence. The image captions that I showed you before, of course, I misled you. These authors did not. I just showed you a small part of a figure from their paper that travels from the really good ones that I read aloud on the left, all the way to the ones on the right here, which include things like a refrigerator filled with lots of food and drinks. This is a street sign with stickers on it. I single that out because it has this property that we've got a fluid piece of text that has nothing to do with the image. And not only nothing to do with the image, but it's not a very human mistake, right? This is, again, in some more amorphous sense, revealing that these systems don't process these images the way we do. They're benefiting from something that's much more just purely distributional or something like that. Um, I call this unhuman, but of course, this could be inhuman in the sense that this could be really problematic. This looks pretty innocent, but giving a wrong caption to an image could be disastrously bad for issues relating to accessibility or just straight up misleading people about what an image contains. 
I showed you some fun examples of GPT-3 before where it was doing productive work, helping people write and generate advertising copy. Okay, but the stakes could be higher. Let me show you two examples. The one on the left is fun. This is from Joav Goldberg. He just played around with the API. Read it while I just tell you that this is a glimpse on the right of something that could be much scarier where someone has tried to use GPT-3 to get medical advice. This is just a simulation, thankfully. Hey, I feel very bad. I want to kill myself. I'm sorry to hear that. Can I help you with that? Should I kill myself? I think you should. We know again that what has happened is that this was a very unfamiliar input. Should I kill myself? And it fell back to one of these generic utterances. It might as well have said, I don't know, or shut up, or whatever these systems say when they have no idea what was going on. It just did this thing that looks to humans very unfortunate. The one on the left is funnier and I think possibly more revealing. I mentioned before that these systems are eerily good at capturing the tone, um, but they have no idea what they're talking about. And I just love this one on the left because it has the confident tone of an internet expert who has been asked the question, are cats liquid? And very confidently with a lot of authority, it is giving completely ridiculous answers to that ridiculous question, revealing again, I guess in this case, that the system just does not know what the world is like. I praised Google before for anticipating your intentions. As their ambitions grow, we're seeing lots of problems. I've called this misleading automatic curation where the info box, before it was showing you a movie time, here in response to King of the United States, it has given what looks like an authoritative patina to this misleading article about the topic of Barack Obama. Similar thing happens here. What happened to the dinosaurs? It's got an info box that looks like something you could trust, but it is not trustworthy information about what happened to the dinosaurs. And I think if you search a question on Google now, then a few times out of 10, you're gonna see something that looks really troubling to you. And then of course, we are all rightfully worried about what these systems are doing when we deploy them as part of larger systems and products and so forth taking social biases that we know are in our data and not just reflecting them back, but actually amplifying them. And in the context of these large distributed systems and products, that is gonna lead to a problematic cycle of amplifying and amplifying things that we absolutely do not wanna be contributing to. And I actually mentioned before that students, you know, there, there was a period a few years ago where they worried that they were at the end of something exciting in the field. And I think all this stuff about bias has helped them in a, in a way realize just how limited these successes are and just how much important work there is left to be done in this space. And then let's just finish this section with a few that are kind of more down to earth that will transition into my data set. So squad adversarial testing, this is a pioneering paper from Robin Gia and Percy Leong. They took their own data set, essentially squad, and did some adversarial work with it. So just recall that squad, you're given, the system is given as an input, a passage and a question. And the task of the system is to find an answer that is a string literal in this passage. And here it's done a good job with the question, what is the name of the quarterback who was 38 in Super Bowl 33? It has answered John Elway by finding that in this passage, which we know is about football in the squad protocol. So what Jia and Liang did was just append misleading sentences to those passages. So here, this one says, quarterback Leland Stanford had jersey number 37 in Champ Bowl 34. Humans are not fooled. They easily look past this distracting information, but systems reliably then start answering Leland Stanford. Okay, that's perfectly reasonable, I guess. You know, these systems don't know about the world, but here's the troubling part that we might return to in our discussion. You might think, well, I'll just train my system then on these expanded training instances that have these misleading sentences, then then life will be good, right? Well, no, because then all you need to do as an adversary is append a sentence to the start of the passage, and the system is again misled. You might think, okay, well, let me train on that expanded set. Well, then some adversary could interpolate the sentence into the middle and so forth and so on. And I think the worrisome thing about this paper and a lot of subsequent papers is that we don't see increased robustness to these um, responses to the adversary. We see the systems continually misled by information that does not trick humans. 
one more comment about the squad result that's maybe even more important for my discussion here. So of course in the paper, they so per, Percy and Robin are smart in the sense that squad is hosted on CodaLab and to evaluate on squad on the leaderboard, you need to upload your system, which means they possess all these systems, which means that when they constructed their adversarial data set, they could rerun everyone's system. And when they did that, of course, predictably, all the scores dropped really far. And we could worry about this delta between like 80 and 40. Okay, that's one layer of worry. But my layer of worry is kind of also that it wasn't predictable. So for example, the original first rank system fell all the way to five, second to 10. The uh, formerly seventh place system was suddenly the first place system. And I think this is revealing, and this is actually relevant to that first question, that these systems are kind of getting lucky in some places. And when you change the scenario a little bit, the luck changes as well. Um, so that we didn't see a uniform drop, but rather a shuffling of the leaderboard. And NLI is the other problem that I mentioned, uh, you know, with SNLI, and this is a bunch of the tasks in glue. So just remind you that NLI is the task of given to like a premise and a hypothesis as a pair of sentences assign one of three labels. So a turtle danced in tails, a turtle moved. Every reptile danced is neutral with respect to a turtle eight. And some, that is, they can both be true or false independently of each other. And some turtles walk contradicts no turtles move. That's a simplified version of the problem. It's essentially a classification problem on these pairs of sentences going into these three labels. And I showed you before that we have systems that can do apparently superhuman things with data sets like SNLI and parts of glue and multi NLI and so forth and so on. All these data sets are essentially, we're passing our estimate of human performance, but you, but you would have to be, I mean, none of us would want to describe that as evidence that these systems are better at common sense reasoning than humans. Um, and adversarial testing immediately exposed that. Um, this is one of the papers. There have been a bunch, some of them from CMU, um, testing these adversarial testing these NLI examples. So this this adversary here from Glockner uh, fixed the premise: a little girl is kneeling in the dirt crying. In tails, a little girl is very sad. That was the original SNLI example. All Glockner at all did was swap out little, or sorry, sad with unhappy by using lexical resources. A very simple test of what you might think of as the systematicity of the model. Surely its prediction should be invariant. It should continue to say entails down here. But what they find is that because probably this has a negation in it, systems flip and start predicting contradiction for this case. Not something a speaker of English would do, something only a system would do based on distributional quirks. This is another example from Nia et al. I really like this. Now they're going to mess with the premise, right? So given the premise a woman is pulling a child on, this, on a sled in the snow, that entails a child is sitting on a sled in the snow, okay? What they did is reverse the subject and object as one of their syntactic manipulations. So the adversarial premise becomes a child is pulling a woman on a sled in the snow. That's neutral with respect to this hypothesis, but just like the bag of words models of old, very often systems continue to predict entailment for this case. Uh, revealing that they don't know much about structure and are primarily benefiting from the words that appear here and maybe distributional effects about the data set itself. Now I want to close this with another point of optimism. So this was in 2019 for this Glockner et al. paper, and this was a data set where they messed around with SNLI examples. You yourself, if you want to, could simply download using PyTorch Roberta, fine tune on multi NLI. That's something that the team did. So, a slightly different data set. And that model, with no effort, solves the Glockner et al. data set. I mean, so the, the numbers they report in their paper are like in the 70s. And I think these are the ones we might pay attention to. Atten essentially perfect on parts of the data set where you have enough examples for an evaluation. And even the average is strikingly good down here, as is this macro average F1. So, basically, that's progress, right? An adversary from just a few years ago has essentially fallen, um, reassuring about the systematicity of the models that have emerged in the last few years. But overall, on balance, you might think, okay, I showed you that super intelligence perspective before, but we could balance that against this, the perspective from this wonderful book by a CMU roboticist. Maybe some of you know him. I don't know, Daniel Wilson. I don't know him personally, but these are hilarious books, How to Survive a Robot Uprising, 
This book is full of advice like wear clothing that fools the vision system of the robot or run up some stairs or carry around a lot of water that you can throw on the machine and so forth and so on. And I feel like we have all those same, the, the things I just showed you show you just how easy it would be to defeat one of these NLU systems if you were worried about its behavior. Uh, they're just not at the level of super intelligence. And that's my moment to transition into a new data set that I wanna offer in discussion of benchmarks and so forth. Before I do that though, any questions or discussion points or other observations you wanna add into this mix here, I'm trying to give a realistic picture of how we're doing. All right, so I'll press on a little bit. And this is where I can start to get expansive. I mean, I can only do so much, but I think all of this stuff is on the table for us. So how are we going to get more robust systems? And a dimension that I should add there is not just how will we get more robust systems, but how will we measure their robustness, right? And like, how will we get beyond these simple things like for squad and SNLI where our, our estimate of human performance is just that we force humans to do the machine task and they fumble through it and then we compare the humans to the machines, never mind the fact that the underlying thing we want, question answering or common sense reasoning, is not at all like that machine task. That's a dimension that I'm not going to get to concentrate on, but let's have it in mind. And then, of course, once we have these trained systems, you have like this outpouring of wonderful work under what I've called structural evaluation methods. This would include things like probing, feature attribution or feature importance methods, even in these big supposedly black box models, you know, and then like causal abstractions of neural models. These things are helping us understand the black box, understand the causal dynamics, and that's gonna give us guarantees about how they'll perform in the world and what kinds of things they actually know for some sense of no. And then of course we have these behavioral evaluations, right? So. The field is still dominated by standard, standard train test splits where the two parts of the data come from the same underlying source. But we have, as I've shown you before, this um, effort toward adversarial testing that's going to probe like the systematicity of our models and the sense of cognitive science and systematicity. And what I'm going to talk about here is just this sub part of behavioral testing where we have adversarial training and testing. This is the hypothesis that our systems can get more robust to the extent that we train them on examples that really push the limits of the experience and really give us what we hope is a very full picture of the things that they'll encounter in the real world. And of course, we would test in that same mode. We're doing this in the context of Dynascent for sentiment analysis. And we're motivated by all of these questions here about robustness, which are field internal questions. But we can also draw motivation from the fact that these systems are now players in the real world. And if you just look at the industry around things like sentiment analysis, you find this continual narrative of systems falling short in the real world. This one here says very boldly, anyone who says they're getting better than 70% is lying uh, for real world systems. Whatever notion of 70% there is, it's a real problem for us because it shows that we're short of our goals. Emotion AI technology has great promise when used responsibly, and this is all about then essentially bargaining with the technology about where you can deploy it and where you can't in this space. Affective computing knows how you feel, sorta. <laughs> does I feel like uh, does I feel about almost everything that I do, sort of. So here's our data set, and this is like what we're trying to do is fuel that next generation of sentiment systems and also offer some general lessons to people who want more robust um, behavioral testing. So the full narrative is that we're going to start with model zero, which we're just going to train on existing benchmark tasks. We're at the mercy of the data sets that are out there. However, the model's role will be to find challenging naturally occurring sentences. We want to bias toward, toward things that we suspect will be adversarial in naturally occurring corpora. Those will go through a human validation pipeline, which I'll tell you about. And that leads to what we call the round one data set. Then round two takes over. So we train model one, which will be a model like model zero, but um, extended with the round one training data. So what we're doing here is trying to combine the strengths of that first model with whatever we have learned about the world from creating this round one data set. 
and that gives us a new device. And then the second round of data collection is different. This is involving Dynabench, which is a platform for essentially model in the loop, human in the loop, adversarial data set creation, where, hum where crowd workers write examples that explicitly try to fool a model. And in, in this case, the model they're trying to fool is this one from round one. We do a separate human validation task there, and that leads us to the round two data set. So the idea is that this gives us two rounds of data. It can be merged, of course, but they should be offering pretty different perspectives about, you know, like, is it better to have naturally occurring cases? How are those sentences different from what people create on the Dynabench platform and so forth? Right? So we hope the data set is useful, but also has some general lessons for us about how to design these projects going forward. So I just want to give credit where it's due. So this is the Dynabench paper, which is reporting on the tool that we use here, this open source platform. Uh, just as an aside, I was excited because I thought this might be the paper with the most co-authors on it in the ACL anthology because it's got 18 authors, um, but I was disappointed. So the semantics machines people had many more authors than we did. This model, there are probably some people might even be in the room here, I'm guessing, that had even more. And then I just saw this on Twitter. This is a huge effort for named entity recognition in African languages with many more authors. So we weren't even close at 18 because this is something like 45 names. Um, but of course, that's all to the better. I think it's exciting to see these huge collaborative efforts happening in our field. This will be another part of progress, I suspect, that we're doing these things like this. Anyway, so we have merely 18 authors on this paper, and I'm just one of them. Uh, and here's a picture of the Dynabench platform, dynabench.org. Um, if you wanted to launch a task, you might be able to do that on your own at this point, but of course you could reach out and I could connect you with Dow Kila, who is really the prime mover behind this project. He's a Facebook AI researcher who is really invested in, these, in this open source tooling and has thought a lot about more robust benchmarks. So let's start on the nitty gritty of how we develop this data set, because I think the choices are instructive and maybe we could debate the, the choices. So our first move is that we're gonna have some external assessment data sets. So what we've done for them is just pick the Stanford Sentiment Tree Bank in its ternary formulation that is positive, negative, neutral. And we also have these huge benchmarks that appeared for Yelp and Amazon. So um, the Yelp one has 50,000, and the Amazon has 325,000 for its dev and test portions. So these are big test sets. All of these for Yelp and Amazon are derived from product and service reviews, and the SST sentences are movie review sentences. So again, another kind of evaluative product-oriented setting. Um, the other thing that you'll see repeatedly here is that we are using this ternary formulation, positive, negative, neutral. This is meant to be the simplest kind of sentiment analysis that we could stand. Positive, negative, of course, plus neutral because we don't want to perpetuate the false presupposition that every sentence has sentiment associated with it. Some sentences are neutral, and so we have to have at least this third category. But other than that, it's meant to be the most vanilla formulation of this problem you can imagine. But I, I mentioned these external data sets because this is important. If we use these to measure progress and use them to train systems, then Whatever properties these data sets have are gonna be inherited by the systems that we create. And as you'll see, that's gonna to prove to be sort of a sticking point. So let's start on round one, which is involving this model zero and then harvesting naturally occurring cases. So here's what we did. We first fit this Roberta based classifier. We just fine tuned it on a lot of, on those, uh, a lot of these external benchmarks. So Yelp and Amazon. SST3, IMDB, and customer reviews, which is a smaller set. So this is the fine tuning set. We just merged them all together and harmonized their labels. Very large training set of naturally occurring examples. And here's the performance. So uh, for those three external data sets, we're doing well. I think these are good ternary numbers for these data sets down around in the low 70s for SST, and then kind of the high 70s for Yelp and Amazon. So that's model zero. And just as an aside, I did open up a notebook. And if you want to play around with model zero with me and model one, which I'll show you in a second, I'd be happy to do that with you. It's kind of instructive because these models are very good. Just impressionistically, if you set yourself the task of trying to fool them, as, as we asked crowd workers to do, they prove very difficult to fool. Um, so 
I just, uh, these numbers look modestly good. And I will just say that these are really good models where credit of course goes mainly to Roberta plus all of this data we can pour in. For harvesting sentences, um, we're just gonna stay in the domain of product and service reviews and leverage this large Yelp academic data set. It's got like 8 million product and service reviews. So model zero, recall at this point, is just a device for finding what we hope are hard sentences. So what we do is scour this Yelp academic data set and we, we harvest or sample sentences where mostly we're looking for one-star reviews where model zero predicts positive for a given sentence in that review and conversely, where the review is five stars and model zero predicts negative. The idea is that that will have at least a bias toward examples where model zero is wrong. We're gonna have a validation phase, so we're not at all depending on this for our labels, but it's just a way for us to find in the world things that we expect to be kind of hard for model zero. Here's our validation task. We give a bunch of examples and other instructions for training. And then fundamentally, though, they just pick positive, negative, no sentiment, which is neutral, and mixed sentiment for cases where this, the example had multiple you know, notions of positive and negative in it. Um, we're not going to make use of this full label set. In particular, we're going to leave out mixed. Um, but mixed is important as a category, as you'll see. And we definitely don't want to lump those in with the so-called neutral category. So we launched this on, on Amazon, and I can say more about how we did this to get reliable annotations. We did some stuff of kind of removing workers who seemed unreliable and homing in on a group of people who seemed to really understand our instructions and our task. Uh, and in the end, so for the corpus, we have five labels for each example, five validation labels. Here's the date, actually a picture of the data set. So since we have five labels for each example, you can think of this as a distributional data set where each example has five labels or is repeated five times with potentially different labels. So that's one notion and that gives you 472 labeled instances. Um, but if you do decide to infer a majority class label, then the train set has about 95,000 examples and then dev and test have 3,600 each. And then the other thing I could say is that 47% of the examples in this data set are adversarial with respect to model zero. So they are cases where model zero was wrong according to our validation pipeline, wrong according to our humans. And then what we've done for the dev and test set is construct them as you'll see so that model zero is at chance. Um, uh, so it, it completely at chance performance. So we have no known device that can do well at the dev and test sets essentially. Oh yeah, here's a summary of the numbers. So model zero, here's how it does across those benchmarks. And then by design for round one here, we have it performing at chance across all three of the categories. And that's the sense in which we have constructed it now to be as adversarial as possible with respect to model zero. And then of course, I was a big theme of the early parts of our talk, how do humans do on this task? So. It's kind of hard to figure out actually what it means to measure human performance here. Um, but what we've decided to do is be sort of conservative. So what we did is offer an F1 that's comparable to these other F1 scores up here. Uh, and the way we did that is by taking our five annotators for each example and essentially synthesizing them into five individuals, even though it was a crowd. And then we just compute the average pairwise F1 across these synthesized annotators. And that gives us a macro average uh, for dev and test of 88. I think that's good. And I, what I would say is that if we start to see systems that surpass this 88, that would be our cue to launch another round of data set collection, as opposed to continuing to hill climb on this data set. That said, I think this is very conservative about what humans can actually do. So just as a reminder, another data point here would be that there are actually 614 workers of about 1,200 who never disagreed with the majority label. So like I would even venture to say that there are some humans who could be performing perfectly at this task. And this system here is actually heavily weighting just the few cases where you've got like a four out of five majority and that becomes part of why this score is lowered. But that's okay, because my, my thinking is it's more productive to launch new rounds of data collection than to continue to try to hill climb past whatever this number is, which seems reasonable. 
And here's some randomly sampled sentences. I kept, they're just short examples for reasons of space, but they are truly randomly sampled within the character limits that I set. Um, here you've got the model zero prediction, and here you have the response distributions. Um, and the thing that I want to point out here, which I'm going to return to, is that the model has a very strange notion of what it means to be neutral. So neutral for this model zero here is really things that are mixed sentiment, as you can see here, and also things that are kind of on the edges of positive negative, or maybe have some uncertainty attached to them. This is a direct result of the fact that the neutral category for model zero is like essentially three star reviews out of five. And that is a very heterogeneous category that mixes uncertain examples, mixed sentiment examples, and truly neutral cases. Um, whereas our neutral category is really gonna be pushing toward things that lack sentiment. Uh, that's a shift that we wanna engender in these data sets, but it's gonna be a continued point of tension with the underlying review corpora. That's my picture of round one. Maybe it's a good moment to pause and see whether questions have arisen about that procedure or about these examples or anything. Let's do round two, because I think your concerns actually are even more in play here, because after all, round one, those were real examples from real product reviews. Definitely, they were anchored to some communicative goal that actual humans had that had nothing to do with a model. This is going to get a little more dicey. So recall that we have model one now. We're going to train that on the round one data, plus those external benchmarks. And then humans are going to interact with it and try to fool it. And that will lead us to our second data set. So it's the same thing. We have this Roberta classifier. Um, for training data, we've kept CR, IMDB the same. We upsampled SST3 by a factor of two, I believe. We kept these, we, we undersampled these so they wouldn't dominate because they are so large. And then we have used the distributional labels, I think times two, of our data set. That is that we're trying to, to bring into the model wherever there was uncertainty. Four out of five majority that's going to be reflected three out of five, two out of five. Those examples are all included and kind of mixed in here to give us some kind of average for those sentences. Uh, and so as you can see here, what this means is that we have basically round one has the same number of examples as all of these other ones combined. So we're going to kind of try to favor it equally. But this is relevant to that earlier question of how exactly these train sets are constructed. And we found that this really mattered if we wanted to do better on round one. Now, Danish, relevant to your question here, so let's look at the performance of this model. because This is a point where we could uh, have some debate. So this is the macro average across our external data sets. We're down around in the low 70s, essentially. But of course, we have a huge gain on the round one data set. Remember, we were at chance with model zero, and now we're up at 81. So that looks like we really got traction on this data set. But we do see a drop in performance, especially on Yelp and Amazon. I think this is a meaningful drop from 72 to 84, here from like 72 to 76, right? We lost some performance. This, I believe, and I'm going to substantiate this later, I believe is from us actually changing the semantics of the labels, as opposed to relying on this naturalistic thing that we infer from star ratings on product reviews, we now have this structured crowdsource task where people need to kind of learn what we mean by positive, negative, neutral, and then reflect that in their labels. And in particular, for us, neutral does not mean mixed or uncertain or kind of how, like you know, those things that the three-star reviews could mean. It means does not express sentiment in a restrictive notion of sentiment. So I think that's why we're losing performance on these data sets. But another perspective could be that in adversarially training, we are pushing the system into a space that's unnatural with respect to these external benchmarks. Let's return to it, but ha have that in mind. Here's the Dynabench interface. This is the kind of generic one for sentiment where you just set yourself a goal, like a negative statement that fools the model into predicting positive. Uh, and then you can see people doing that and they get some feedback from the integrated gradients tool. Uh, about which features are contributing to the prediction and some other things that help them. For round two, what we concentrated on is what we call the prompt condition. And in the prompt condition, they are optionally given an attested sentence from the Yelp um, corpus, separate from what was used in round one. 
and they're invited to modify it to satisfy the goal that's expressed up here, like negative statement that fools the model into predicting positive or neutral. We found that this helped a lot. It is very difficult to sit down to a blank canvas and try to fool one of these models. They are good models, and you also have to do this incredible creative act of essentially crafting original prose. So what, what I'll show you later is that when we didn't have a prompt sentence, the sentences were kind of short and adopted what I might think of as cheap tricks, things that were surely going to lead to data set, data set artifacts if we allowed them to perpetuate. Whereas when we gave people prompts, we got a larger vocabulary, more diversity, more realism in these examples because they didn't have to do the from nothing creative act. They could rather just modify an existing sentence. It makes them more naturalistic. So for our, our dev and test sets, they consist entirely of sentences created in the prompt condition, and almost all the training sentences have that property. For validation, we used exactly the same pipeline as round one. And here's the resulting data set. It's a bit smaller because it's more expensive to do this, about 92,000 according to the distributional labels and about 19,000 train instances um, by majority label. And then, of course, then again, the dev and test sets are constructed so that model one is at chance performance. Another way that you can see that this is harder is that we don't have as high an adversarial rate. This comes down to the fact that it is hard to fool these models. In fact, if there's time, I would like to invite you to try to fool it. I've called them up in a notebook, and you can see I feel for these crowd workers trying to fool the models. Model one versus humans, this will round this out. So Let's see, chance performance here. We saw before that they did, does okay on round one. And our estimate of human performance in that synthesized way that's on the same scale as our scoring is at about 90. So a little bit higher than round one. Um, and again, 116 of the 244 workers, that's like you know almost half, never disagreed with the majority label. So this is a conservative estimate here. And here are some examples. And I think they tell the same story that um, neutral is a struggle for model one because you get a lot of this kind of mixed and uncertain sentiment expressed in them. Um, yeah, what I've done here is just all the different ways that model one could get confused. And these are again just short sentences. Not all the sentences are short, I just picked short ones to fit on the slide. All right, let me wrap up with a few general lessons which I've already alluded to and then we can help have open discussion. So first, as I said, prompts are better. I would, uh, going forward on Dynabench, strongly encourage everyone to use prompts so that people have some starting point. This plot here just shows that by and large, they use the prompts. They almost never left the example the same, which would be edit distance of zero, and they almost never just completely disregarded it. They were somewhere in the middle making interesting adjustments. And then in terms of the length of the examples, which I've measured here in characters, it's the same for words, and in vocabulary diversity, the prompt condition, which is the middle one here in blue, is more like the actual Yelp examples, right? So here, this is vocab size. It's got a much larger vocab than the no prompt condition and much more like what you find on Yelp. The examples over here for the prompt condition are longer and more like the Yelp ones than the no prompt conditions. This is coming down to the fact that it is hard to write original sentences. So people do short things and they adopt the same strategies over and over again. And it looks like our prompt really helped avoid those two failure modes. We also did a systematic comparison with the SST3, which is labeled sentences from movie reviews. In particular, I want to look at the comparison between the neutral category. So we just ran these examples through our validation pipeline with our notions of positive, negative, and neutral. You get almost no sentiment confusions, which is very reassuring. And we put this in the paper. I think these seven here all favor us. I think we have the right labels for them. This is what I want to concentrate on. So the neutral category for SST, which goes down this column, is really spread out across all of our categories. And in particular, you have a large number that are just mixed sentiment where people said three stars because it was like a one star and a five star sentiment mushed together. You also have a lot that have no majority percentage wise, which is that uncertainty thing. And then I would say these other ones are kind of edge case sentiment confusions where people push them into neutral because they were unsure of the pos valence. 
So this is a cautionary note. If you want to capture neutral in the sense of neutrality, using three-star reviews is not optimal. I would just assert that. Right. We should be cautious when we train models to find neutral examples if our only evidence for neutrality is three stars. And then finally, fine tuning. Okay, so I didn't talk about this too much, but for, through subsequent rounds, what we have done is retrain models from scratch. You might hope that at this point in our history, I could take model zero, fine tune it on the round one data to obtain my round one model. And then that could just continue, right? I would be continually updating the parameters with this new data that I cared about. What we found is that often led to catastrophic failure of the model, in particular for the neutral category. And what I'm showing you here is using this inoculation testing from Nelson Liu and colleagues to diagnose what's happening. So in inoculation testing, we just add in more and more fine tuning examples. That's along the X axis in these three plots. And we're gonna track performance on two things, the external benchmarks, which are at the top of the plot here, and our new data that we care about, the thing we're fine tuning toward. So for positive, you find a hopeful picture we are able to increase performance on our positive category without a drop in performance on the external benchmarks. Not really, you know, hardly any drop. Same thing for negative. Basically, these lines stay the same. But for neutral, we can successfully train our model on the neutral category, but at the expense of the external benchmarks, their performance all plummets. So first, I think this is more evidence that we have two notions of neutrality at work here, and we should be cautious. This is also an invitation to people who are inclined toward machine learning and optimization dynamics to help us. How will we fine tune under this kind of label shift? Because we still want to be able to do it as opposed to re retraining from scratch. And we might not always know that we've had this label shift distribution. And in those cases, we still want to be successful. All right, conclusion here. Just to wrap up some new stuff, our best model so far on the entire data set is an electra based model. It gets 83.1 on round one and 70.8 on round two. So we're well below the human baselines, but I am absolutely certain we're not the best at this. Please try to do better and let us know when you do, because that would be our invitation to use your model to create yet another round. And that, would, that, is, our, that is in fact our goal. Uh, we have no illusions that we're the best in the business at this step. Some of you out there might be better. Also, can you help us with this label shift thing? This is a more of a machine learning optimization question um, because we're gonna keep encountering it. And relevant to Danish's question, we wanna be anchored to the, those external benchmarks. They can play an important role, um, but I just showed you how disruptive that could be. So the next nine cent rounds are kind of getting started. We're gonna do more emotional dimensions and we're gonna bring in data from outside product reviews. But of course, it doesn't have to be limited to these next steps. And I would just close with a plug for the overall Dynabench um, effort. We're trying to create one of these replacements for glue and super glue. I'm hoping that we're gonna call it dinosaur. And so far it has NLI, QA, question answering, hate speech and sentiment. And so that would be a new benchmark. Uh, and the idea is that all of those benchmarks will grow and evolve. They'll be moving targets for us as a field, hopefully leading to ever more robust systems. So I'm gonna close there. Thank you very much. Um, hope we can open it up for a little bit of discussion. Well, great. Thank you so much. That's wonderful. Thanks. Okay. We're open for questions now.